I've been interested in true crime since I was really young and in that time I've probably seen or heard about hundreds of cases. One type of case I always found particularly interesting were the solved murder cases where the victim's body had never been found. I can't imagine how hard it must be for family or friends to know their loved one is dead but not have the closure of being able to bury their remains. I came across today's case while looking into ones like it, and as far as solved murder cases with no body, it's one of the most bizarre ones I've ever heard. This is the story of the disappearance of a two-day-old baby named Tegan Lane. But if we really want to understand Tegan's life, we have to look at her mother, Kelly Lane. Kelly Lane was born on March 21, 1975, the first child of Father Robert, a police officer, and Mother Sandra, a hospital administrator. A few years later, Kelly was joined by a younger brother named Morgan. In 1979, when Kelly was four, the family moved to Manly, a northern suburb of Sydney in New South Wales in Australia. Growing up, Kelly was a daddy's girl, the apple of her father's eye, so it's no surprise that she ended up following in her athletic father's footsteps. At the time, Robert Lane was an avid surfer and rugby player. He was a coach for the Manly Rugby Union Football Club, and he had ambitions to play rugby professionally, but that never worked out. By the time Kelly was just eight years old, she was intensely into water polo. By her teenage years, Kelly and her family were well-known in the small town of Manly. As the child of a well-known rugby coach, Kelly was popular and used to getting her way. An attractive blonde, Kelly dated frequently and was in quite a few relationships. While some boys were reluctant to get involved with the daughter of a policeman, Kelly generally didn't seem to have trouble getting male attention. Kelly was still serious about water polo and trained hard, but also partied hard. In the sources I found, Kelly's parents weren't painted in the best light. Kelly's father was seen as very strict, and her mother was described as tough, cold, and distant. Kelly's mother was also the manager for the New South Wales water polo team that Kelly was on, and both of her parents seemed to take her water polo ambitions very seriously. The Lane family also didn't like talking about emotions, especially negative ones, and Kelly learned from a young age to suppress them. Interestingly though, Kelly's boyfriends when she was younger seemed to sleep over at her house with her parents' knowledge and consent, something you wouldn't expect most parents to be okay with, especially parents that were considered as strict as the Lanes. Kelly would later say that her first sexual experience was at age 15 and that it wasn't consensual. The case has never been investigated and nobody has ever been prosecuted, but assuming it's true, it had to be a traumatic experience for Kelly, and unfortunately it wouldn't be the last traumatic experience she would undergo. In 1992, when Kelly was 17, she was dating a boy named Aaron Tyak. At some point in their relationship, Kelly got pregnant for the first time. She only told Aaron about this, and after discussing it, the two agreed that Kelly would have an abortion. Neither of them particularly wanted an abortion, but in their minds, there wasn't another option. Abortion is illegal in New South Wales unless the mother's physical or mental health would be in danger by continuing the pregnancy. Since Kelly got on a ferry to travel and have this abortion, I assume she went somewhere where it was legal or at least where she wouldn't be likely to face criminal charges. Erin didn't go with her but met her on the returning ferry afterwards where she fell into his arms and sobbed. Kelly got pregnant again less than a year later. She and Erin had either just broken up or were about to break up, so she didn't even tell him about this pregnancy, which also ended in abortion. Just a side note, as of 2018, New South Wales is the only Australian state where abortion is still a criminal offense. A bill introduced in August 2019 would allow abortions up to 22 weeks, after which they would have to have the approval of two doctors in order to be performed. 
I don't tell you this to try and push an agenda or sway your opinion on the legalities of abortion in any specific way. This bill was introduced in August 2019 and I'm filming this in September 2019. So if you're watching this in the future, just keep in mind that these laws might either be about to change or have already changed. There aren't a whole lot of details about Kelly's second pregnancy and abortion, but she would later say that these abortions were traumatic for her and that she didn't want to have another one. In 1993, it was announced that the 2000 Olympics would be held in Sydney, right in the lane's metaphorical backyard. Some of Kelly's water polo coaches have said that she never really wanted to compete in the 2000 Olympics, but others have said that the Sydney Olympics were her dream. This supposed Olympic dream would later be used against her, but we'll get to that later. During her late teens, Kelly spent a lot of time at the Manly Rugby Club. It was here that she met a football player named Duncan Gillies in 1994. Duncan was tall and handsome, and known as a ladies' man, as well as a promising football star. Dating him would certainly help Kelly's social status even more. They soon became a couple, and their relationship became sexual almost immediately. They never actually lived together, but Duncan would often spend the night at Kelly's house with her parents' knowledge and consent. In 1995, when Kelly was 19, her life seemed to be going well. She'd failed to make the Australian women's senior water polo team the previous year, but still seemed to be playing for the New South Wales team. She also worked part-time at a surf shop and continued to see Duncan. But in her small town, people talked and people were talking about her recent weight gain. She often wore baggy clothes and was careful to not show her stomach when she didn't have to wear a swimsuit for water polo. But nobody seemed to want to press her on the issue. Her mother would later point out that baggy clothes were fashionable at the time. As someone who was a child in the 1990s, this definitely strikes me as believable. Most people ultimately assumed this was nothing more than typical weight gain, possibly caused by things like too much drinking or partying. Some people suspected she was pregnant, but never pressed her about it. Or if they did, she vehemently denied it and it wasn't brought up again. At some point in 1995, Duncan confessed to Kelly that he had cheated on her with a friend and teammate of hers. Kelly was upset, of course, but ultimately forgave Duncan. Duncan had no idea that Kelly was in her third trimester of pregnancy when this happened. On or around March 19, 1995, Kelly and the rest of the New South Wales water polo team played in the water polo grand finale, the last game of the season. They didn't win, but went out afterwards to celebrate the end of the season. During the celebration, Kelly went into labor and left early. People noticed that she left, but didn't think much of it. Kelly soon arrived at Belmain Hospital, about a 30-minute drive away. She was later transferred to King George V Hospital, where she gave birth to a baby girl. Kelly told the hospital staff she lived in Perth and gave them a fake address and phone number. She would later say that she picked Perth because she'd been there several times recently and because it was far away. Indeed, Perth is on the opposite side of Australia, and the trip to Sydney would take at least five hours by plane. I'm not sure how Kelly explained why she was giving birth on the opposite side of the country from where she lived. She also lied to explain away why her family and friends weren't present for the birth. She listed Duncan as the baby's father on the birth certificate, though DNA would later prove that this was not true. The father of Kelly's baby was actually a man she briefly dated right before she and Duncan started dating. Two days after giving birth, Kelly turned 20. She and her baby were technically still admitted to the hospital, but allowed to leave on a day pass. This was pretty rare, but Kelly was given the special privilege because she told hospital staff she was leaving to talk to her boyfriend about placing their child for adoption. Meanwhile, Duncan had no idea Kelly had even been pregnant, let alone just given birth. While Kelly was out, she celebrated her birthday with family and friends, all of whom were ignorant as to what she had just been through. Kelly ultimately did choose adoption for her new baby, 
She turned up to all of the appointments and hearings she needed to in order for the adoption to go through and always lied about why Duncan wasn't there. I believe she ended up forging his certificate on papers in order for the adoption to go through. After Kelly's secret pregnancy and adoption, her life seemed to return to normal. She made the New South Wales Senior Water Polo Team in 1996, and she continued to see Duncan, though there were rumors of him cheating. Their busy schedules also made it difficult for them to see each other that much. In March 1996, Kelly celebrated her 21st birthday. At the time, it seemed like a fairly normal 21st birthday celebration. Nobody knew at the time that Kelly was four months pregnant. Later that spring, some of her teammates saw her at a training session. She was wearing a towel and refused to take it off until right before she got in the water. Once again, the suspicions and rumors of pregnancy began to swirl, but once again, nothing was ever confirmed. Later in 1996, Kelly enrolled at the Australian College of Physical Education with hopes of becoming a PE teacher one day. In August of that year, she began to work part-time as a water polo coach at Ravenswood School for Girls. She was apparently pretty well liked at Ravenswood, with one student describing her as approachable and friendly. Another student said that if she had lost her virginity, she would tell Kelly about it before she told her own mother, indicating there was a high level of trust between Kelly and her students. On September 10, 1996, Kelly checked into Ride Hospital, saying she had back rib pain and that she was 42 weeks pregnant. She was released the following day. Around 8 a.m. on September 12th, she was admitted to a different hospital, Auburn Hospital, and induced later that morning. At 7.52 p.m., she gave birth to another baby girl. According to hospital records, Kelly bonded with her new baby, bathing and breastfeeding her. As far as I could find, adoption was never brought up, as was the case with her previous child. From what I can tell, hospital staff was under the impression that she would be keeping her baby. Kelly asked to be discharged on September 14th. Hospital staff agreed that she could go, but gave her a consent form to take a blood sample from her new baby. She was also given a Medicare form for the new baby, and seemingly only filled it out because a staff member was in the room watching her. It was here that she wrote down the name Tegan Lee, apparently only giving that name because she had to give a name. Kelly left the hospital without ever filling out the consent form for a blood sample. It's even been speculated that she left via a fire escape to avoid walking past the nurse's station. A follow-up home visit was arranged to get the filled out form, get the blood sample, and perform a final weigh-in for baby Tegan. Hospital records say that Kelly left the hospital around 2 p.m. that day, but eyewitness accounts would later say it was actually sometime between 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. After being discharged, Kelly traveled from Auburn Hospital to the home she shared with her parents in Fairlight, another Sydney suburb. She's thought to have arrived there around 3 p.m. Duncan, who had been out of town playing in a rugby tournament, was there waiting for her. At 4 p.m., Kelly, Duncan, and I presume the rest of the Lane family attended a family friend's wedding. Tegan was nowhere in sight during this time. This wouldn't have appeared unusual to anyone there as they had no idea Tegan even existed. But sometime between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. on September 14th, Tegan Lane went off the radar. According to later testimony by Kelly's mother, Sandra Lane, she drove Kelly and Duncan back to the Lane household after the wedding and Duncan stayed the night. A week after being discharged, Kelly called Auburn Hospital and canceled the home visit, saying her midwife would take care of the things the hospital still needed. Interestingly, Kelly listed Duncan's mother, Julie, as her midwife. Julie was a nurse, but not a midwife, and like everyone else, she had no idea Kelly had ever been pregnant. After Tegan's birth, Kelly's life once again seemed to return to normal. In 1997, she suspended her education to try and make the Australian water polo team. 
She had been playing for the New South Wales team, but I believe this was a national team she was trying to make. I don't think she ever reached that goal, but she did make the senior stateside team in 1998. Once again, I'm not too familiar with Australian culture or professional sports, so if anyone is able to provide more details or context about this, feel free. In 1998, Duncan and Kelly's relationship ended when he left her for another woman. A few months later, she started gaining weight again, and those around her assumed it was from stress. But once again, Kelly was secretly pregnant. In February 1999, when Kelly was about 25 weeks pregnant, she traveled to a Planned Parenthood in Queensland seeking an abortion. As of 2018, abortion is illegal in Queensland up to 22 weeks, after which point it can be performed if it's approved by two doctors. In 1999, it was illegal in all circumstances, but rarely prosecuted, which might be why Kelly chose Queensland. However, she was denied an abortion because she was too far along and was sent home. Later that year, she gave birth to a baby boy and made plans to place the child for adoption. Hey everyone, I hope you can hear me. I know that was a problem the last time. But I just wanted to pop on really quick and say that, yes, I know that this information that I gave you is a little bit weird. Like I said, in 1999, from the information that I found, abortion was illegal in Queensland, but it was very rarely prosecuted. So in that case, why would Kelly have been denied an abortion? Because specif specifically because she was too far along. This is just the information that I found. It doesn't make sense to me either. My personal guess, and this is just my opinion, is that the workers at Planned Parenthood decided that they didn't feel comfortable with performing the abortion, maybe because she was so far along. So they denied her the abortion because of that, even though it technically not would have been legal, but they probably wouldn't have faced any legal consequences. I know this sounds like it could be contradictory, and maybe it is, but as always, I wanted to provide you guys with the facts and information that I found in my research, and you can form your own speculations or conclusion. Once again, Kelly listed Duncan as the baby's father, although he had no idea she'd been pregnant. At this time, they'd been broken up for over a year, and he was overseas when the baby was conceived, so this wasn't possible. Duncan found out about this soon afterwards and, of course, denied it. At the time, he was living in Manly with the woman he left Kelly for. DNA tests would later confirm the baby's father was a friend of Kelly's brother, Morgan. Kelly had had a brief relationship with this man after she and Duncan broke up. Kelly also told the adoption agency that this was her first child. Even though she was using the same adoption agency she had for her first birth and adoption in 1995. They also had access to records that showed Tegan's birth in 1996. Kelly would later admit to Tegan's existence, saying she lived with a family in Perth. Much like with the 1995 birth, Kelly gave hospital workers a fake name and address. While her baby boy was in foster care, she was contacted several times to sign important documents to make sure the adoption went through. But of course, she could never be reached. The adoption agreement eventually lapsed, and the baby became a ward of Australia's Department of Community Services, or DOCS. The department's name was later changed to Family and Community Services, and recently changed again to the Department of Communities and Justice. The baby boy's case was assigned to a DOCS worker named John Borovnik. John was on vacation when the case landed on his desk. After arriving back at work and looking at the files, his co-workers told him it would probably be an easy case. It wasn't. John Borovnik took a look at the case and immediately knew something was fishy. At first, he thought it was just a case of a mother trying to abandon her child. But then he realized that there was a baby born in 1996, Tegan, and there was no record of her existing after leaving the hospital on September 14th of that year. In November 1999, he officially reported Tegan as a missing person three years after she'd last been seen. Back in Manly, Detective Matt Cahoe was assigned to Tegan's case. 
But Keho knew Kelly's father, Robert, who of course was also a police officer at one time. I believe he was retired by this point. Detective Keho didn't do much investigative work into the case and didn't even interview Kelly for over a year. I've seen people say Keho shouldn't have even been working the case at all. He apparently did try to get off of it at one point, but it didn't happen. He says his relationship with Robert Lane didn't affect the case at all and blames his lackluster work on something else, corruption. In 1999, the Manly Police Department was under harsh scrutiny, which resulted in an investigation known as Operation Florida. Six officers were charged with and later convicted of drug trafficking, bribery, and theft. Keho wasn't one of the officers charged, but the police station was temporarily shut down and several documents went missing. It's not clear if any of these missing documents were about T and Lane's case, but this entire situation is what Detective Keho blames everything on. Meanwhile, Kelly's life once again went on as normal, at least on the surface. In 2000, she moved in with a family friend named Peter, since both of them needed roommates. But shortly after moving in together, their relationship went from friends to more than friends. In November of that year, just weeks into their relationship, Kelly told her new boyfriend that she was pregnant and that she was keeping the baby. Kelly, Peter, and the rest of their family and friends prepared for the birth, excited about what they believed was Kelly's first pregnancy. It was actually her sixth. She eventually gave birth to a baby girl and by all accounts was a loving mother. She even brought her baby to school at Ravenswood and showed her off to students. In 2002, Kelly and Peter got engaged. Only one source listed his name as Peter and named their daughter as Macy, but their names actually can't be publicly disclosed, so I assume these are pseudonyms, though I will be using them for the rest of the video for the sake of clarity. But back to 2001. On February 14th, Kelly, who was seven months pregnant with baby Macy at the time, was finally interviewed by Detective Cahoe. When asked about Tegan's whereabouts, Kelly said she'd given Tegan to her biological father, a man named Andrew Morris. This, of course, contradicted her earlier story that said Tegan was living with a family in Perth. According to Kelly's new story, she and Andrew Morris met in a pub and had a brief relationship. At the time, she was still dating Duncan Gillies, and Andrew had a longtime girlfriend named Mel. Despite this, Andrew and Mel agreed to take baby Tegan and raise her. They arrived at Auburn Hospital on September 14th along with Andrew's mother and drove Kelly to Duncan's house. Kelly also told Detective Cahoe she and Andrew had celebrated his 30th birthday at a pub a few weeks before she gave birth. She also claimed none of her friends knew about Andrew. Remember, all of these details are strictly according to Kelly. There's no evidence that a man named Andrew Morris, his girlfriend, or his mother arrived at Auburn Hospital on September 14th. There's also no evidence that Kelly was at Duncan's house at all on September 14th, as every other source said she went straight from the hospital to her home that she shared with her parents. One other thing I find interesting about this interview is the Medicare card. At one point, Kelly pulled out the Medicare card with Tegan's name on it and showed it to detectives. She'd had it with her this whole time, but there was no evidence of anyone named Tegan Lane ever being brought in for medical care. Kelly's story was odd, but not criminal, so she wasn't charged with anything. Detective Cahoe would later search for Tegan's birth certificate, but couldn't find it. As we'll see later, it didn't exist at the time. He also searched for men in the area named Andrew Morris, but couldn't find any that matched Kelly's description. Meanwhile, nobody told Robert Lane that his daughter was being investigated for the disappearance of the granddaughter he never knew existed. In 2002, a new detective, Detective Senior Constable Galt, was assigned to the case. He found Kelly's story about Andrew Morris believable and went into the case thinking he'd find Tegan alive. But when he interviewed Kelly again, two years after her first interview, some of the details of her story changed. This time, Kelly said Andrew was angry when he found out she was pregnant, calling her a slut and accusing her of getting pregnant on purpose to trap him. Kelly had also told Detective Cahoe that she and Andrew celebrated his 30th birthday together at a pub. 
But this time, she said she and Andrew had no contact between her telling him she was pregnant and him agreeing to take baby Tegan. The birthday drinks, she claimed, didn't actually happen. They were in the pub at the same time, but Kelly was in a different area, not celebrating with Andrew. Kelly had also previously said that none of her friends knew about Andrew, but this time she mentioned a friend named Lisa Andretta. She said Lisa knew about Andrew, but that she and Lisa were no longer in touch. But detectives were able to track Lisa down. Lisa said that not only had she never heard of Andrew, but she and Kelly had been in contact recently. Kelly's lies were starting to pile up. But the most notable lie, the one everyone in this case keeps bringing up, is the name change. Remember, Kelly had originally told detectives that Tegan's biological father's name was Andrew Morris. But this time, she said his name was Andrew Norris. After this interview, Detective Gott did more extensive searches. He looked for men in the area named Andrew Norris that could have been Tegan's father. Schools in the area were notified to search records for students born in 1996, possibly named Tegan. Medicare records were also searched, as well as passport records to see if Tegan had left and or re-entered the country but all of these searches led to nothing. Kelly was interviewed again seven months later, but this time her story didn't change. Police took her to the apartment complex she said Andrew had lived in at the time, the same apartment where the sexual aspect of their relationship, for lack of a better phrase, had been carried out. She couldn't remember exactly which apartment he lived in, and neighbors who lived there at the time said they didn't recognize her. Tegan Lane definitely existed. Hospital records show that Kelly was there on September 12th and gave birth. The staff, as well as Kelly's roommate, all remember a baby. But after she left the hospital with her mother on September 14th, Tegan Lane seemed to have vanished into thin air, or at least from public record. She didn't even have a birth certificate until 2005. During the investigation, Kelly's friends old and new, were contacted by detectives and began to realize that something was up. With people beginning to catch on, Kelly was afraid of her reputation being damaged and her family and friends cutting ties with her. A month before they were supposed to be married, Kelly told her fiancé, Peter, about her secret life. He was shocked, of course, but stuck by her side, and the wedding plans continued as usual. Kelly told her mother about Tegan, but not about the other babies. The police told her father everything else a few days later, and I believe they also told her mother about Kelly's other pregnancies. Another source said that Kelly actually told her father everything. Her parents were shocked, but later said that they were detached to some extent because we had a wedding coming up. Neither her parents or husband-to-be pressed her on details for fear of isolating her. Peter would later say, I certainly don't think it will benefit us as a couple for me to delve into those details. The official inquest into Tegan Lane's disappearance began in June 2005. At first, investigators still believed Tegan may be alive. They searched schools, birth records, deaths, and marriages nationwide for anyone named Tegan Lane, Andrew Norris, or Andrew Morris. They found a few men with those names, but eventually ruled them all out. At one point, the DNA of a nine-year-old Queensland girl named Tegan Chapman, whose father's name was Alan Norris, was tested, but she too was ruled out. Overall, the records of more than 86,000 children were searched. Kelly's records were also checked, her medical, bank, and telephone, but those two led to nothing. Kelly got a cell phone in December 1996, but those records were never searched because this was several months after Tegan had been born and after her disappearance. Investigators also thought Tegan's name might have been changed after she was given to Andrew Norris or Morris, but I'm not sure how extensively this possibility was looked into. Unidentified dead children were also looked into, as well as fraudulent birth certificates. In early 2006, the inquest concluded. The New South Wales coroner noted several things in his conclusion. 1. Nobody had seen Tegan since 1996. 2. There were no records of her after that. 3. Kelly had told many elaborate lies about Tegan's whereabouts. 4. 
Nobody had ever come forward to say that they had Tegan. Because of all this, he concluded that Tegan was probably dead and had been since 1996 or around there. But of course, without a body, he couldn't say how or why. He recommended that the case be passed to the New South Wales Homicide Squad, which it was in February 2006. The Homicide Squad did several of the searches that the inquest had, but in more depth. They also checked immigration records and interviewed men who had been in the country at the time of Tegan's conception. They also looked into babies left anonymously at hospitals, churches, police stations, or even on the street. All of these searches led to nothing. Cadaver dogs searched the home that Duncan Gillies had lived in at the time of Tegan's birth. Bones were found on the property, but further testing determined they were animal bones. It's thought they are the remains of a family pet buried on the property. In or around 2007, Kelly and Peter separated. In November 2009, Kelly was charged with murder and three counts of perjury, the latter of which stemmed from the lies Kelly told while she was arranging for adoptions. Kelly's trial began on August 9, 2010. The case was so complex, jurors were given colored flowcharts to help them follow the details. The prosecution claimed that Kelly killed Tegan to avoid the responsibility of raising her, to avoid tarnishing her good image, and because having a child would interfere with her goal to compete in the 2000 Olympics. The defense said there was no proof Tegan was even dead. Kelly had already placed two children for adoption, which suggested that she could have done the same for Tegan. Andrew Morris slash Norris could have been a fake name, and if he had given a fake name, he could have easily also changed Tegan's name, which is why neither of them had ever been found. In the end, over 75 witnesses were called for the prosecution. The defense called no witnesses. Not even Kelly took the stand. But first, I want to talk about a couple of witnesses that were at the pre-trial hearing, but not the actual trial. The first is a man named Andrew Morris. Morris claimed he had unprotected sex with Kelly in a park in 1994, but didn't pick up any babies at the hospital nine months later. He had also never had a girlfriend named Mel. Tian wasn't born until two years after this alleged sexual encounter. The prosecution initially wanted Morris to take the stand to show where Kelly supposedly got Tegan's father's fake name, but he was later told he wasn't needed. I believe he was dropped due to a deal between the prosecution and the defense, something along the lines of, I'll drop my witness if you drop yours. It's also worth noting that Kelly denies ever meeting this man. Another person worth mentioning is Natalie McCauley, a childhood friend of Kelly. According to Natalie, Kelly told her about a man named Andrew that she was seeing in late 1995, around the time that Tegan would have been conceived. Natalie was convinced this was the Andrew Morris slash Norris, who Kelly claimed still had Tegan. She said she distinctly remembered the name Andrew because that was her brother's name. At one point, Natalie even said she met Andrew, but this turned out to not be true. She spoke at Kelly's pretrial hearing, but didn't come back to testify in the actual trial. She said in one interview that she wasn't sure why she wasn't asked to testify at the trial. But at the time, she lived out of the country and was pregnant. She wouldn't have been able to fly back to Australia in time for the actual trial, so she testified at the pretrial hearing. Even though they were no longer together, Peter took the stand and said that Kelly was a great wife and mother and that he loved her. By this time, Kelly was back together with an old boyfriend named Patrick Cogan. They were engaged at one point, but I'm not sure if they ever actually got married or if they're still together. Another witness who did end up testifying at the trial was Kelly's most famous ex, Duncan Gillies. Like I said earlier, Duncan found out about Kelly's third baby, the baby whose adoption set this whole case in motion, pretty early on. But he didn't learn the full extent of what had happened until much later. By that time, he was living in Ireland with the woman he left Kelly for, who is now his wife. 
Kelly gave birth twice during their relationship, but Duncan never knew that she was pregnant. He said that if he had known, he would have been excited and jumped at the chance to start a family. He described their sex life as business as usual. He acknowledged it sounded crazy that he hadn't known about the pregnancies, but admitted he didn't have a clue. The trial went on for four months before the case went to the jury. On December 13th, after a week of deliberation, they couldn't reach a unanimous verdict. So the judge told them they could reach a majority verdict of 11 to 1. Later that day, Kelly was found guilty of murder and all three counts of making false statements. When the verdict was read, she collapsed, yelled, oh no, and began sobbing. The outburst was so bad, paramedics were called to attend to her. In April 2011, Kelly was sentenced to 18 years in prison, where she remains today. She'll be eligible for parole in 2023. An appeal was filed, partly on the grounds that the jury should have been able to consider charging Kelly with manslaughter. The appeal was rejected in 2013. One person who spoke at the sentencing hearing was a taxi driver. He claimed he drove Kelly home from the hospital on September 14th. According to him, Kelly told him to stop at River Road on the way to Manly. She got out and left the baby in Bushland alive. Hey everyone, another contradiction. I know. I actually don't know exactly where Kelly's parents lived at the time of Tegan's birth in 1996. I know I said earlier that it was Fairlight, and then most other sources have said Manly. So again, just keep that in mind. Different sources said different things. I just wanted to clear that up. Back to the video. Apparently, Kelly didn't know that the man saw her do this, because when she got back to the taxi, she told him that she left the baby with a babysitter. Once the driver dropped Kelly off for good and she got out of the taxi, he noticed that there was a diaper bag in the back seat that she was about to leave behind. He called out to her that she'd forgotten it, but she said she didn't need it anymore and left. The driver returned to the scene where he found the baby and a woman. The woman said that she was going to look after the baby, so the driver decided not to contact the police. Keep in mind that this story has never been substantiated in any way. So at this point, you might be wondering the same thing that most of Australia was wondering as this story unfolded. How on earth could Kelly have hidden three full-term pregnancies and subsequent births? How could nobody around her have known? As I've touched on before, a few people did have their suspicions. Kelly's friends, teammates, and other acquaintances around Manly took notice of her weight gains. Some people assumed that she had adopted bad habits like too much drinking or that her frame simply made her look bigger. Kelly would later tell the police, I'm a big girl anyway, so the pregnancy was very wide. Others thought she was pregnant or even almost positive that she was pregnant, but either never pressed her or didn't press her enough for her to give up her secret. Friends and acquaintances are one thing, but how did Kelly hide her pregnancies from Duncan Gillies, who she dated and had a sexual relationship with for four years? Kelly apparently did this by adopting certain sex positions when she was pregnant, pushing Duncan's hand away from her stomach when he tried to cuddle, and leaving the house early in the morning before he was up on the night she slept over. But maybe the most baffling people to not know about her pregnancies were the people she lived with. Kelly's parents were just as shocked as everyone else when her secret life unraveled. Kelly's mother said at one point that she felt stupid for not noticing the pregnancies. But later on, she said that she actually didn't feel stupid because nobody else knew either. And as I stated earlier, she also noticed that Kelly wore a lot of baggy clothes, which probably helped to hide it at least somewhat. So this case is technically solved, but so many questions still remain. Let's look into some of the theories as to what actually happened to Tegan Lane. The first theory is that Kelly's original story is true, that Tegan was given to her biological father, Andrew Norris or Morris, who is still raising her. They might have never been found because they're living under aliases. 
Andrew Norris Morris might have even given Kelly a fake name because he knew their relationship would be an affair and didn't want her or anyone else to be able to track them once things were over. If this is true and Andrew Norris or Morris has changed his name and or Tegan's name, Tegan might still be alive today and have no idea who she even is. However, this theory obviously has a lot of holes in it. For starters, Kelly's story changed multiple times before she finally settled on this one. She initially denied Tegan's existence at all, then later said she was living with a family in Perth, then came up with her first story about Andrew Morris that she told detectives, then changed it to Andrew Norris. Even that story changed, not only giving Andrew Morris a different last name, but changing other details as well. And the big question remains, if Andrew Norris or Morris really is out there with Tegan, why hasn't he come forward? This case was huge in Australia, so surely he's heard of it. Does he for some reason think that his life and or Tegan's lives are in danger and wants to stay anonymous? Maybe he's angry with Kelly over something and doesn't care that she's in jail for a crime he knows she didn't commit. Or maybe he never existed. So the next theory is that the jury got it absolutely right. Kelly killed Tegan just after leaving the hospital and buried her body somewhere. The number one piece of evidence for this theory is Kelly's many lies about Tegan's whereabouts. Being a liar doesn't make you a murderer, of course, but it is a pretty big red flag. After all, why would you lie about something as important as your child's whereabouts if you had nothing to hide? However, there's not really any physical evidence for this. No DNA, no witnesses, not even a body. Even if Kelly really is guilty of murder, exactly what happened to Tegan on September 14th is up for speculation. The next thing I want to look into is similar, but maybe not quite as sinister. That's the possibility that Kelly didn't physically end Tegan's life herself, but abandoned Tegan somewhere, who later died of exposure. Whether she did this with the intent of killing her or just naively thought that someone would find her, of course this would still count as murder in the eyes of the law. Something else I've seen people bring up and the theory that I tend to lean toward the most is that Tegan died accidentally and Kelly panicked. With the exception of her last pregnancy, the daughter that she kept, Kelly didn't get prenatal care for any of her other pregnancies. Babies born to mothers who don't get prenatal care are five times more likely to die than babies born to mothers who do get prenatal care. Did Tegan die from some sort of complication possibly caused by lack of prenatal care? And did Kelly, who clearly already worried what people thought about her, hide the body somewhere, afraid that she would be charged with murder if anyone found out? One thing I want to mention, there was a plot of land just outside the hospital grounds, or not too far from it, that was vacant at the time. And there has been speculation that she might have left Tegan there. The lot is now home to the Australia College of Physical Education, which moved to that location in 2016. Interestingly, this is the same school that Kelly attended briefly, though it would have been in a different location at that time. I believe there was also another building there before that. So I'm not sure exactly when construction began on this lot, but is it possible that Tegan's remains were there and somehow overlooked? Did a construction worker maybe see her but mistake her bones for animal bones? Or was her body wrapped in a blanket and went unnoticed? Is it still buried there or possibly in a landfill somewhere? Unfortunately, there's just no telling exactly what might have happened. In 2012, the judge in Kelly's case said he had doubts about the verdict because Tegan's body had never been found and because, in his words, it did not make sense to me for a mother to do that. Kelly's parents spoke out in 2016 and said they believed Tegan was still alive and that they couldn't believe their daughter was guilty of murder until a body had been found. Kelly's mother, Sandra, said she believed Kelly's story about giving Tegan true Andrew Norris Morris. She acknowledged it was strange, but said that strange things happen all the time. At this point, the Bridge of Hope Innocence Initiative at RMIT University was looking into the case. I believe they still are. 
Hey everyone, this is the last time I will cut in like this, I promise. I just wanted to address one thing, and that is the subject of Kelly's parents. Obviously, both in this video and in most of the sources that I found, they weren't painted in the best light, as I said at the beginning. I've even seen some people speculate that they actually knew about Kelly's pregnancies and helped hide them. I understand why people have this attitude. Obviously, their statements can be seen as strange, and I understand why people might speculate things like this. However, I did just want to remind everyone that we don't know them, we don't know what their mindset was at this time, and we don't exactly know what their mindset is now at this point. And obviously, they've been through something very traumatic, so I just wanted to point that out. I didn't want the conversation around them to be one-sided. But now back to the video. In September 2018, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation began airing Exposed, the case of Kelly Lane. The hosts of this three-part documentary delved into the case and even did a bit of detective work themselves. Their team created a composite drawing of Andrew Norris Morris based on the description Kelly gave of him many years earlier. They also managed to track down a man who lived in the same apartment complex as Kelly said Andrew lived in during their affair. This man claimed to see a woman who matched Kelly's description leaving the apartment complex early in the morning, which struck him as unusual. I'm not sure how substantial this man's claim is, but the documentary is online if you want to watch it for yourself. I will leave the link below. I also found a news report from December 23rd, 2018 that mentioned a possible retrial, but I couldn't find anything more recent. One last thing I want to mention is the book Nice Girl, the story of Kelly Lane and her missing baby Tegan by Rachel Jane Chen. This is a great resource on the case if you want to delve into it even further than I have here. It's pretty hard to find a reasonably priced hard copy, but check the description for a few links to where you can buy the ebook. So that's just about everything I have on this case for you today. Judging by the comments I've seen on this case, people both in and out of Australia are pretty divided on it. So as always, I would love to know what you think. Do you think that Kelly killed Tegan? Do you think she abandoned her or maybe gave her to someone else? Do you think Andrew Norris or Morris is a real person? Do you think Kelly deserves a retrial? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and share it. And for more dark content, I hope that you will consider subscribing and hitting the bell. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.